This morning's scripture reading is from Ephesians 3, verses 16 and 17. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and, and high and deep is the love of Christ. The word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Acting United Methodist Church. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Thanks, Stephen. So good to have everyone here this morning. My name is Wade. I'm lead pastor of the church. If you are our guest today, we hope and we expect that you will have a great experience of God's grace while you're on campus with us. We also want to make sure that we welcome those who are worshiping with us online. So we hope and expect that they will have a great experience as well. And for those of you who call this your church family and are here every week, our expectation is the same, that you will experience the presence of the living God. When you walked in, we hope that you received the, the worship guide. You'll see some information on, in there about the order of worship. You'll also see an insert, just a first quarter uh, update on what's going on in the life of the church. We hope and pray that you will look that over. You'll also see on the back side some announcements that we want you to be aware of. And you can sign up for any of those items by tearing off that tear-off sheet uh, sign up for it, making sure we have your name on the other side of the tear-off sheet, and then when the offering plate is passed, you can place all of that in the, in the plate, and we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. If you look on the inside of the worship guide, you'll see that there are some congratulations and condolences that are in order today, and we share these because we understand as Christians is that when one celebrates, we all celebrate, but when one mourns, we all mourn, and so this is the information that we have this morning. We want to congratulate Elsie Talent Wallace and Lynn Wallace as they celebrate their one-year wedding anniversary, so we can give God thanks for them. As we celebrate with them, we also want to remember those who are grieving today. Maria Reed and her family on the death of her mother. Joan Robertson and family on the death of her niece's husband. And Donna Yarborough and her family on the death of her mother. So if you know these persons, please reach out to them. We don't just lift up happy thoughts. We actually reach out. That's what we do as Christians. And if you do not know them, would you please lift them up in prayer? If you have ever experienced the loss of a loved one, you know what they might be experiencing this morning. So as their hearts ache, let's come alongside them. Uh, before we do our meet and greet, we have a special announcement to make this morning. I want to invite Winston Polly to come forward. He is a member of our staff parish relations team. And for those who may not be aware of what our staff parish relations team is, it's almost like the HR or human resources team in any organization. They make sure that we as a staff have the, uh, that, that as a church, we have the staff that we need. Uh, the SPR also works diligently with the district superintendent of the United Methodist Church as well as the bishop. And so typically this is a season when announcements are made as to different changes that might be taking place. So Winston, if you want to make your way up to the front, uh, he has a special announcement to make this morning, and so I will give the microphone over to him. Thank you, Winston. Button, Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, church. You know, one thing I've noticed about SPR announcements, every time somebody gets up here from SPR, the first thing that goes through everybody's mind is, oh, Lord, what's going to change? Well, not today. I have exciting news. This is going to be news that you're going to like. We were approached Friday by the district superintendent, and he gave us some inside information that I'm going to be able to pass along to you. Are you ready? You know, when Pastor Chan Soon came to us, we knew it was temporary. And we knew that it was in a format of transition. We were just hoping that maybe they'd forget about the transition and we'd get to keep him. 
Well, as all good things, the district superintendent had better ideas. And he let us know that as of the 1st of July, Pastor Sanchun is going to become the pastor of Covenant United Methodist Church in Arlington. But that's not all. <laughs> we were also informed by the district superintendent that after six years in the trenches here with us, Pastor Amy is going to finally get called up to the majors. As of July the 1st, she is going to become the senior pastor of Crowley United Methodist Church. Now, let me tell you, the both of you, something. Just because you're leaving does not mean you're gone. Your loving imprint that you have left on this church will be with us forever. It'll never disappear. You will always be remembered and always be revered. Thank you both for what you have done for us. <clears throat> there will be more information regarding a appreciation celebration a little bit in the future. Thank you, Pastor Wade. Appreciate you. We're so excited for Pastor Amy and for Pastor Chan Soon, and we're so excited that we've had them for the season, like Winston has stated, and we look forward to coming alongside them as they move on to their next journey of faith. And so, well, you know, in just a few moments and throughout the next eight weeks, you'll want to be able to say hi and congratulate them and give them a, a high five in Jesus' name for the journey that they are about to begin. Uh, next week, we will make uh, announcements on some additional staffing that will be coming our way. But we're so thankful that all of you are here this morning. Now, if you'll take just a few moments, stand up and find someone you haven't said hi to yet and greet them with the love of Christ.
And now, as beloved children of God, I invite you to go to our loving God in just a time of silent confession. God will meet you wherever you are. And now with humble hearts, let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we continue together as a body, we invite you to lift up a joy or concern on your heart today, and we will respond together. Lord, hear our prayers. So what is it we can pray for this morning? Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Faithful God, it was only last week that we stood here and, and sang the hallelujah chorus and proclaimed that you, your son, had conquered death and risen. Today we proclaim that that truth still stands, that even when we turn on the news and we see reports of bombings, of persecution, of, of lives being lost, the Easter message still stands stands, that even when we hear of change and transition, the Easter message still stands, that even when we consider that our loved ones may at some point go and be with you, the Easter message still stands. God, you are greater than anything that we can comprehend and your love, your love far exceeds anything that we can understand in our humanness. We pray today for those around the world who are grieving, who have been devastated. Help them to believe with all their heart that because of your resurrection, even on their worst day, they can have hope. Help us to believe that in our personal lives. We pray today for our local churches. We pray for the Triple Cross Cowboy Church. You know their needs, Lord. May your Holy Spirit be at work in them. As we pray today for our brothers and our sisters, we want to pray for those of us from our congregation who have gone this morning to serve at Sager Brown this week. Be with them in their mission, guide their hands and feet. Lord, as we pray for ourselves, as we pray for those on our hearts, we ask that you would help us to find hope and strength in your Easter message. Because Jesus lives, you will have the last word. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you. As Easter people, let us pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you stand up and affirm our faith through Apostles' Creed? As you know, we are standing here as an Easter people. Whatever situation, whatever the power of evil and darkness try to let us fall down. However, we are standing on this faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you be seated? As Pastor Amy mentioned in her prayer this morning, we did send a team of missionaries today to Sager Brown. I believe we have a picture that will be on the screen just in a second. We sent about uh, 10 people to Sager Brown. That is a United Methodist Committee on Relief Depot out in Louisiana. And it's a mission that we do every year. We send people out there to help prepare for when the next natural disaster hits wherever it is in the world. We have an impact because of our larger denominational ties and because of the people that we send to Sager Brown. However, if you're interested in missions, that's not the only way that you can be generous this week. On Friday, the church will be having our uh, twice yearly opportunity to lead the First Friday Food Pantry at First Methodist Granberry. It's an opportunity for us as a church to get to show up and get to help people, get to show them the face of Christ and give them food at the same time. I've been reminded several times this week that this is a missional church. This is a church that is not content with sitting in the walls of this building. And so whether that's through Sager Brown, whether that's through the First Friday Food Pantry, whether that's through going to Kenya, there are many ways that your generosity is shown. And as we give today, I invite you to think of these things. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for all that you've given us. Help us now to give back to you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ushers.
You may be seated. When I walked in this morning, someone said, oh, you're here. And I said, yes. And they said, well, we were really looking forward to someone else preaching this morning. So <laughs> they meant that in grace and love because the Sunday after Easter is usually a low attendance Sunday because people believe that if they come to church one Sunday, should, they should take off the next. All right. So, but y'all, y'all didn't. So we're so glad that you all are here and you get stuck with me preaching today. So, so glad that you are here. So we're beginning a sermon series on uh, being spirit-filled. And as we focus on being spirit-filled, I want you to think about it in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is I want you to think about your life, and, and I, want, I want you to think about, would you characterize the way that you're living right now as, as thriving, or would you characterize your life as surviving? Those are two different mindsets, and those are two different ways in which you are experiencing life. Do you feel like you're thriving or do you feel like you're just barely hanging on and surviving? And then when you ask yourself uh, those, those questions, you know, do you feel like there should be something more to your life? Uh, you know, for some of us who, who've grown up in Christian world, we, we've heard a lot of sermons and we've sung a lot of songs. And, uh, but when it comes right down to our everyday living, really Sunday through Saturday, seven days a week, Many of us have fallen into the trap of thinking that, that God is an acquaintance. We, we know about God, and, and we may have had a relationship with him at one time that was kind of on fire, if we would say that way. But, but now our lives are so busy, and they're so cluttered, and there's so many things that we've got to do that, that God has, has now turned into just a distant acquaintance. And, and we're not really sure how to stoke the fires again. Others of us, when we're so busy and we're just, we're just surviving, we're not really thriving, we know that there should probably be something different in our relationship with God that would impact everything else. But many of us who've actually grown up in the church, we're not sure exactly what to do to make it happen. We're just not sure. And then there's others of you that, that may not be acquaintances, that may not be in a rut, that, that may not go, oh, I should know better. Some of you just don't know better. You, you've fallen into this trap of just doing your own thing day after day, week after week, moment after moment. And so when we talk about being spirit-filled and living the life that you were created to live, some of you are like, I have no idea what it is that you're talking about. Well, over the next four weeks, we're going to focus on what it means to be spirit-filled, what it means to, to live the life that God created us to live, not just like hamsters on a wheel that just keep on turning the, the wheel, but to live as the people that God created us to be in the first place. And so as we go into this, I, I want to invite you to, to pray a prayer with me. And this prayer might make sense more as we go through the sermon, but I hope that this prayer is something that's transportable for you. Uh, because it's a prayer that I continue to recite myself. And so let me share it with you first, and then you'll share it back, and that will kick off the sermon, okay? So the prayer is this. Holy Spirit, I don't want you to be a house guest in my life. I need you to take over ownership of the whole thing. If that's a prayer that you feel comfortable praying, that you want to live into as we begin this sermon, let's all pray it together. Holy Spirit... I don't just want you to be a house guest in my life. I need you to take over ownership of the whole thing. Amen. So what does this mean? What does it mean to be spirit-filled? Well, for, in order for us to understand what it means to be spirit-filled, we've got to go back to Jesus. Otherwise, we just kind of make this thing up on our own, and uh, we can't do that. Okay, so let's go back to Jesus, and we look at, at Acts chapter 1. And this is a story of the Christian church, volume one, essence, in essence. So Acts chapter one, starting with verse three, after his suffering, this is Jesus. So this is after his death and his resurrection. He presented himself to the disciples and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, 
which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with what? Be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So we are Easter people. This passage of scripture that I just read is happening after Easter, the resurrection. Jesus is appearing to his disciples, very much like he is appearing as the Spirit is testifying to your spirit today. And he was saying, look, there's more to life than just you experiencing belief in me. There, there's a power that you will live by, but you've got to wait for it. If you just generate it under your own strength, under your own personality, under your own experiences, under your own willingness to be an extrovert or an introvert, if you just focus it based on your previous experiences and what you've done well, you're never going to get it. But Jesus said, when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit, you will know that you are not only loved by me, but you are empowered by me to live the life that you were created to live in the first place. So, so what this looks like is this. To be spirit-filled, I, I've kind of broken it down. We're going to spend four weeks really digging into it. But today, uh, hopefully this will be something that, that you can kind of hang your hat on. And I hope and pray that it will be transformative for you. To live a spirit-filled life means that you live as if you're loved by God. Now, this is not a little thing. This is a big thing. Because I know a lot of Christians, and some of you are in this room today, where you know all the right words, but you don't live as if you were actually loved by God. You think there's some performance issue that you've got to do. You've got to cross every T and dot every I. You've got to be perfect. You, you, your family of origin plays a huge part in that. How you were successful or not successful in your work plays a huge part in that. Your, your willingness and desire to achieve among all things has a huge part to play in this. And so a lot of us, because we don't feel like we're good enough, or we feel like God would not love us until we get all of our stuff squared away, you don't live as if you're loved by God. And the reason that I know that is because we are known by our fruit. And we can all, and I can do it as well, we can say all the right things, but we are known not by our words, but by our actions. In fact, let's go, let's go back to Rome as the early Christian church. Here's what the Apostle Paul was writing to the Christians in Rome about being uh, loved by God and living that way. Paul reminds the Christians that for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the what of God? So if you are led by the Spirit of God to be Spirit-led, to be Spirit-filled, you are the child of God. The spirit you receive does not make you what? Yes, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit that you received brought about your adoption to sonship or daughtership. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Father himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So to be spirit-filled means that you live loved by God. Not based on your perfection, not based on how great you've been, not really based on whether you've really lived a really interesting and up and down life. That doesn't disqualify you. What qualifies you to live loved by God is the love of the Father. Where because of that love, we are embraced by God and we look into the eyes of the loving Father and we go, what's next, Papa? I know that I'm loved by you. What's next? Maybe you have had a physical father that was anything but loving. Maybe you learned to distrust because of your father figure in your life. And because of that lack of trust and understanding of the love of the father, it really makes it difficult for you to, to cross over that threshold to understand the love of the father in heaven. But to be spirit-filled is to understand that the love of the father that we are speaking about blows the love of your father out of the water, no matter how bad that was, but no matter how good it was, the love of the Father leads us to be spirit-filled, to be filled with the presence and love of God so that we can live as loved people. To be spirit-filled is to also live victoriously over your animal urges. Uh, look, left to my own devices, I will resort to my, my base nature, won't you? 
unless I've got people holding me accountable, I will just resort to, to living in the animal kingdom in my responses. It, you may be more put together than I am, but I know that that's a struggle in me. And to be spirit-filled means that we live victoriously over our animal urges. And, and, and you need to come to grips with that in the name of Jesus. That there's a fine line that separates us between being part of the animal kingdom and living as people that God created us to be. There's a fine, thin, red line that redeems us through the blood of Jesus. And if we don't live into it, we can succumb to living just like animals, and we're not called to live that way. In fact, in Galatians, the Apostle Paul says again, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be what? Yes, but do not use your freedom to indulge the what? Rather, serve one another humbly in? Yes, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And then to get how he describes this, he's talking to Christians who had already placed their faith in Jesus, but it was a slippery slope that they could fall back into living unrepentant lives he said this, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the what? And you will not gratify the desires of the what? Yes, to be spirit filled means that you live victoriously over your animal urges. That you will live by the spirit filled with the spirit that we are known by the fruits of the Spirit. And later on, we will learn that the fruit of the Spirit primarily is love. And then love is manifested in our joy and our patience and all that other list that, that signifies who it is that we are as Spirit-filled people. So when you think about your life this week and if you're surviving or thriving, for those of you who think that you are thriving let me, let me ask you that only you can answer. If you really feel that you are thriving in this, in this life and that you are really walking with Christ, then let me ask you, who are you harboring unforgiveness towards? Who are you harboring unforgiveness towards? Who is that person that you have chosen to have conversations with behind the scenes and ever face-to-face but you've had conversations with, when you think about them, that you kind of grimace a little bit because they bring you pain? Who are the people that you think about that if you did have a conversation with them, you would really tell them what you think about them? If you think that you are thriving, but yet you harbor unforgiveness, you are not thriving, you are just surviving. You are really giving in to your base animal nature. If you gossip, you are giving in to your base animal nature, even if you think you are thriving. So forgiveness and, and gossip and slander. And if you're not reaching out to those who are in need, you are not thriving. You are just surviving. And the Apostle Paul tells us what it means to live spirit-filled lives, not based on what the flesh desires, but based on what the spirit desires. So let me, let me just dig in just a little bit more on this. Husbands, when you interact with your wife and with your kids, no matter how old you are, are you being led by the Spirit and are you loving your spouse sacrificially and submitting to them like you submit to Christ? Or are you a holy terror to your spouse and kids? Let me ask this question. What would others say about you? And wives, are you always nitpicking on your husband or your kids or your neighbors? Are you, are you snooty? Is your nose so, so high up in the air that you drown when it rains? That, that's your base nature. That's your flesh. And we are called to be spirit-filled and spirit-led, not be led by the flesh. We also understand what it means to be spirit-filled is that you live with purpose on purpose. I think sometimes we as Christians, we just kind of have this hope so, think so. We're just going to kind of float through life. And if we're just nice to, to stray animals and, and, and little kids and, and we don't cause too much of a problem, then we're living a life well lived. And that's a lie of the devil. We're to live on purpose, for purpose, as spirit-filled people. In fact, go back to the words of Jesus. Again, Jesus said, peace 
be with you as my Father has sent me, I am sending. Mm. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the what? If you forgive one another's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. To be filled with the Spirit is to live on purpose for a purpose. You are filled with the Spirit to be sent out for one. But then as you are sent out, you are meant to be an instrument of God's grace. And how you interact with one another, how you forgive one another. If, if you are harboring grudges, if you are harboring angst, if you are harboring pain, if you are harboring destruction, if you bring dissension everywhere you go, look, you are not living on purpose with purpose. You're just aimly kind of floating by, and God created you for more than that, y'all. He created you for more than that. Whatever it is that you are torqued up about right now, whatever that thing is that gets you stirred up right in the middle of your chest, whoever that person is, that seems to be a thorn in your flesh to be spirit-filled is to remember the words of Jesus that as the Father sent Jesus, he now sends us to go out into the world to bring the light of Christ into this dark world which is characterized by people who live according to their animal urges. And we are called to be a light into the darkness, to, give, to be a milepost, to point people to the way of Christ. That's what it means to be spirit-filled. God desires you to live in the way that he created you to be, not the way that you've settled to be. There's a guy by the name of E. Stanley Jones met this guy from back in the day. He was a missionary to India for years. Fantastic guy. And he said this, unless the Holy Spirit fills, the Holy Spirit, what? Yes, unless the Holy Spirit fills, the Holy Spirit fails. So think back over the last few days. Have you been surviving? Or have you been thriving? And over this next month, do you sense that there might be something more to life that if you leaned into it, you might grasp what it is that God has in store for you? I want to invite you to, to receive an invitation. And it's an invitation to, to live as if you're loved by God. Not just in your head, but that you sit in the loving embrace of the Father, that you, that you live victoriously over your animal urges and that you live with purpose on purpose. Next, next week, we're going to be baptizing people. And I hope that, that some of you might respond to that invitation, that you would place your faith in Jesus perhaps for the first time or for those who have just been surviving, you will stand up and reaffirm your faith once again and lean in because the Holy Spirit has come to capture you. I hope that you will respond to that Otherwise, are you thriving or are you surviving? God created each one of you for more. Now, what are you going to do about it? Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the day, and I thank you for your love. I thank you that you are more powerful than our animal urges. I thank you, Lord, that you create us for a purpose. And Lord, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will fall and fill and lead each one of these persons here in this room and who are watching online, Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, those who are helping with communion, please come forward at this time. On the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he had dinner with his disciples, and at this dinner he took a loaf of bread, and he gave thanks to God, broke the bread, passed it amongst his disciples, and said, Take and eat, each of you. This is my body, which is broken for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you take it, do it in remembrance of me.
He then took the cup, gave thanks to God, passed it amongst his disciples, and said, Take and drink each of you. This is my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you take it, do it in remembrance of me. So although we are many, we share the one body and one blood of Jesus Christ. If you are a guest of ours today, you're welcome at this table. And it's my joy to welcome you at this table because it's not my table and it's not your table, nor is it the table of your neighbor next to you. It's Christ's table, and he invites you to come and eat with him. And I can't think of a better invitation in all the world than to dine with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I hope that you will take that that invitation to heart. In just a few moments, we're going to invite you to come forward. There are going to be several stations. When you come forward, if you'll come with your hands cupped, you'll be given a piece of the bread. If you'll take that bread, dip it in the cup, place it in your mouth, and then you can spend time at the prayer rail or come back to your seats. We'll also have a few stations in the back. This is something that we're living into in the traditional service. We've been at it for about four weeks now. We're still working out the logistical kinks. So with that being said, I know because you were spirit-filled people, you were going to receive the invitation with grace. And when someone stands in front of you or cuts in line, you're going to forgive them. Amen? (laughs) It's the Lord's Supper, y'all. We can all rush to the front. It's okay. But you're not going to have an usher direct you right now. But what we do encourage you to do is maybe from the front back, you start just kind of making your way up to the front, if that's easier for you. Just kind of look at the row in front of you, and then when they get done, you go ahead and come up, if that might be easier. Or you can just run up to the front. It's completely up to you. It's dinner. The bell has been rung. Let's eat. Let me pray for you, and then we're going to invite you to come forward. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. We pray your blessing upon this bread and cup that they will be for us your real tangible presence. Lord, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy, and Lord, we thank you that your intentions for every person in this room is greater than anything they can even imagine. Draw us to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you come and feast at the table of our Lord?
We have sung songs to the Lord. We have come together as a community to pray to the Lord. We have heard the word proclaimed, and we have dined with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in response, all of God's people can say, Amen. Amen, amen. amen. We're so glad that you are here today to worship the, the risen Savior. And our hope and prayer and expectation is that you walk out filled with God's Spirit. So as you consider how you might walk out to receive that invitation, would you please stand as we sing our closing hymn of praise. That is indeed the great thing that we know, that the Holy Spirit walks with us always. We are never alone in every season of our life. That Holy Spirit is the constant, the reminder that God is with us. So go forth this week and live a Spirit-filled life, walking with Jesus, trusting in our Lord, knowing that God is always with us. Go in peace. Amen.